resume recording. So we'll miss the few first few seconds there, but it was just me droning on. So anyway, we're going to have a recording that'll be available um, on our website as well. So you can revisit this or share it with friends later on. So we entitled this, um, this session, Get Back on Your Bike. Um, what we hope to do is share some tips um, and some useful information for folks who, you know, maybe you haven't uh, hopped on your bike since, say, last fall. I, I keep referring to Halloween because I remember we had snow on Halloween. And, and oftentimes that first snow is when a lot of folks will put their bikes away. So if, it, if it's been since Halloween, maybe it's been longer. You know, maybe it's been several years. Uh, Perhaps you've seen more and more people out on the roads and on the you know, on the trails, and, and you're just, you know you're kind of have some renewed energy about biking. Um, we want to cover some basics that will help you be safe when you're out on your bike. All right, so um, this is just a, kind of a smattering of statistics. You can obviously read them on your own, um, but you know, in preparation for this webinar, I wanted to just pull some stats from various sources. Um, from you know over the last decade or so, that just kind of paint the picture of how um, some of, of some of the woes of society, I guess, and then how cycling uh, can have a positive impact on, on the average person's life. Um, so maybe just to call out a few here uh, is that you know in Illinois, so 32% of adults, and this was from 2018, and 14% of of youth, um, age 10 to 17, are obese. Uh, that's that's a pretty startling stat. I'm sure you guys have all heard stats about how just in general becoming a little less healthy. Uh, women who bike 30 minutes a day have a lower risk of breast cancer. Um, and in general, uh, anyone who bikes um, fairly regularly is going to have a lower risk of some of those, uh, you know, cancer or some of those long-term um, diseases is a word I'm thinking of that escapes me right now. Um, I thought, uh, just call out one more, the adolescents who bike um, are 48% less, less likely to be overweight. Perhaps it's because it becomes part of what you do. Um, perhaps it's because of the health benefits um, early on. That, that, that maybe, maybe it doesn't matter, but it's, it's kind of encouraging that, you know, if, if, if as a young person you ride your bike, you, you're going to be in, in better shape. So Lots of interesting stats there. Um, what I want to talk uh, quickly about, and for some of you, this is going to be kind of that, uh, maybe a, a, like, duh, or, a, you know, I know this kind of stuff, but, you know, we want to talk about the benefits of biking. Um, the obvious one is, is for health. So your physical health, you're burning calories, you're increasing your metabolism, uh, building muscle, preventing diseases, um, mentioned the reduced risk of cancer. Uh, your mental health as well. So studies have shown that folks who, uh, and we're not, we're not talking, you know, 100 miles a week, we're talking folks who just go around the block, maybe, you know, get maybe 10 miles a week, right? Have, but they have improved focus, increased confidence is another thing. Um, and then from an emotional standpoint, um, it had cycling, exercise in general has a positive impact on your emotional state. So whether it's stress or depression or anxiety um, or all three, <laughs> um, cycling can have uh, a positive impact and, and reduce some of those feelings. From an environmental standpoint, um, I don't know if, if you all have noticed, but just with fewer cars on the road in the last, what, five, six weeks, as well as uh, I'm right out by O'Hare and so literally don't hear any airplanes, the air just, you know, it, is cleaner, right? So that's kind of the idea. We're, we're seeing um, at, on a massive scale, you know, what happens when there's fewer internal combustion engines, but um, just by, by biking, um, even in normal times or what we'll, our new normal will be, will reduce the amount of pollution in the air, um, reduces your carbon footprint. Um, obviously you're not burning um, gas or needing oil. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of ways that uh, a bike can be that green, um, that green vehicle, the way you get around. From an economic standpoint, uh, this one I, I find quite interesting. Actually, one of the reasons that I started um, commuting way back, way back now in 2006, but you know, to, to look at how much of an economic impact uh, biking can have. And so just a quick stat here, the average annual cost of car ownership in the US is about $8,500. Whereas the average annual cost of, of owning a bike is about $475. So that's 
you know, it's quite a big difference. Um, and for a 10 mile trip, whether it's a commute or an errand, uh, whatever, uh, you, you save about five bucks. So, you know, maybe you sock that away and go on a vacation or do something fun with it. So just know that there are certainly some economic benefits. Um, from a community standpoint, um, communities that embrace cycling and encourage their residents to, to ride are more sought after. There are communities that people want to live in. Um, can be more affordable because you don't have a lot, as much infrastructure for cars or the need to re, replace and repair it as often. Um, and actually it's gonna to lead to safer roads uh, and then just more interaction with your neighbors, right? You see people when you're out. So that's certainly a benefit, uh, assuming you like your neighbors. And then the infrastructure I mentioned earlier, so, you know, a 25 pound bike, a 20 pound bike, you know, whatever you're, obviously has less of an impact on asphalt and concrete. So more bikes means less wear and tear. Um, but so the, and just from a financial standpoint, the cost of a like bike lane, putting in a bike lane um, can range between five and $50,000 per mile. Whereas the cost of your typical like arterial road is two to 10 million. So now think of it from a standpoint of you know, your tax dollars and what they're going to be used for. So long story short, lots of, lots of great things um, that biking can do. So I want to move on to this next one here. And this, this is probably something that's, that some of you've seen, right? So this was a, um, a uh, I guess, a, a definition or some terms that a gentleman from Portland uh, by the name of Roger Geller he was a planner for Portland and years ago wanted to determine, you know, what type of infrastructure is necessary um, within uh, an urban community, right? And so he came up with four definitions of a cyclist or of, of an individual, right? So strong and fearless was the first one. And that's basically you're willing to ride anywhere. You don't need specific bike infrastructure. Um, you're going to get out there and, and you're going to do it and nobody's going to tell you otherwise. Um, the enthused and confident person is willing to bike if, you know, if there's some infrastructure in place, there's certain, there's going to be limits to where they want to, maybe some of the roads that they'd ride on or the conditions they'd ride on. Um, interested, but concerned. So this, these are people who you're know, like, yeah, you, if you build it, we will come. Right. And this is, tends to be the biggest pot where people fall into. And I'll share the percentages after I, ask a poll question. And then about a third of people are, they're not going to ride no matter what, right? And maybe it, maybe it's a physical condition. Maybe it's, um, they're anti-bike. Maybe they, you know, they just, you know, they're not, they're not cyclists. So you we have to accept that some people are just not interested. So what I'd like to do now is ask the folks that are on the call, and I'll launch this poll here. So what type of cyclist do you identify as of those four types? Got about, oh, there we go. We got the cream of the crop here. All right, I think that's, Gina, you, you have the opportunity to vote if you'd like. But I, I did vote, so did. I may have skewed your no, results. No, no, fine, 13 to 14. All right, so you guys are uh, in basically the top 8%. So 1% identify as strong and fearless, 7% as enthused and confident, 60% are interested but concerned, and then 33% are just, they're not gonna ride no matter what. <laughs> so Richard yeah. Gordon just said we have Holly, so we have the cream of the crop. <laughs> nice. nice. All right, thank you for responding to that poll. All right, moving on. Um, so Gina and I are going to have a little fun with this, all right? So um, Gina so, is going to be the questioner, and, I, and I'll yes. provide some answers. So Gina, what question do we what, have? What bike is right for me? That's a great question, Gina. Um, and what I, so for those of you that are on the, uh, the webinar, it seems like you are, you know, seasoned cyclists, most of you already. Um, assuming that we're going to have some folks watching this later on, um, I want to make the point that you know we're right illinois and our advocacy work we want to appeal to your average um, illinois resident right so when it comes to 
a, you know, the, the type of bike that's right for someone, it doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg. Um, so there's obviously lots of different types of bikes and the four images I, I chose um, that you can see there, you know, are just a few of the myriad of, of types of bikes that are out there, right? Um, but the idea is, you know, just find a bike that um, is in decent shape, that fits you properly, um, that, you know, that doesn't uh, break the bank and that, that, that's bike, that's the only bike you need. Um, and some folks will swear that you know, they only need one bike and, and you know, for most people that, that is anything you need. Um, so yeah, and e-bikes too. E-bikes are gonna be huge um, as far as for, for transportation, right? So, you know, we're seeing it now, um, kind of a big boom in e-bikes, not to, not to belittle your comment, David, but um, you know, when it comes to folks being able to say ditch a car, a second car, um, or you know, to, to get around for some of those short trips, an e-bike, that, that could be the answer. <clears throat> so sizing wise, we're not gonna go into uh, great detail here, um, but just, you know, I think we've all seen folks who maybe their seat's way too low or they're just too big or too small for a bike. Um, a properly sized bike is going to allow someone to, to ride, is going to um, encourage them to ride more often because it's not painful and it's efficient. Um, so obviously a bike shop can help with sizing. Um, friends, knowledgeable friends can help with sizing as well. Um, and then the ABC Quick Check is a, is a very uh, useful and quick um, check that you can do on your bike where you check the air in the tires to make sure that <clears throat> you know, your tires are properly inflated. Every tire that I've seen has the, uh, the inflation, the, the PSI or the recommended PSI right on the sidewall. Uh, if you don't have a pump, um, you, you could fill it up. I'm sorry, if you don't have a pump with a gauge, fill it up to the point where the, the tires are firm to help avoid flats and also make it easier on you. The brakes, you know, your brakes need to stop you. So if, if you, when you pull on your brake levers, if it comes all the way to the handlebars, they're not gonna give you the greatest stopping power. Okay, so that's a one real quick check is just make sure they're not coming all the way to the grips. Um, and then the C is the chain. Make sure your chain's not rusty. Uh, I've seen some bikes that <clears throat> perhaps have been left outside and uh, you know, get, just get covered in rust. So you know, that, that's something that's gonna make the, the ride that much more difficult and perhaps um, incurred or discourage someone from riding again. Uh, and then the quick is the quick release levers, which we want closed. And then check, we just want to make, uh, just want to make, make sure your bike looks like it's ready to go. Okay, so you can share a, uh, <clears throat> a link later on um, or after the session to videos of the ABC quick check. Um, and then basic maintenance um, recommendation is, you know, you might learn some tricks along the way and tips, but if, if you ever you get to the point where you're not comfortable doing something you're just not sure, you know, maybe derailers fall into that category. Um, know that there are, what are we at, 200, 202 bike shops, I think, in Illinois, based on the map on our site. So there's, there's folks all over the state that can help you out. As far as where to buy a bike, um, I, I tend to break it into three categories. Um, what, number one is your big box store. So your Walmarts and your Targets, um, you're gonna get an inexpensive bike. Um, not gonna be the best quality, but if that's your budget, that's where you go to buy your bike, okay? Um, middle of, the, middle of the, the road is um, your sporting goods stores, which seem to be coming less and less, but think of like a Dick's Sporting Goods. Um, they're gonna have more knowledgeable staff, a wider selection. You're gonna pay a little bit more, um, but you'll get a better quality bike. <clears throat> and then our recommendation is if you can afford it, go to a local bike shop. You'll get the attention you deserve. You'll be able to do more test rides. You can tell them, hey, this is what I wanna do. This is where I wanna ride and they can match you with a bike um, that is right for you. But uh, yeah, you do get what you pay for, for sure. If you're looking for a bike that's gonna last many, many years and can afford to, to put a little more money into it, uh, you're gonna be happier in the long haul. Gina, do we have another question? Do I have to wear a helmet? Ah, uh, it's a good question. Um, no, it's not a law, um, in, in part because helmet laws have been 
proven to dis discourage cycling. So uh, no, you don't have to wear a helmet. Of course, we highly recommend it. I know when Gina and I teach classes, it is a recommendation in our classes, um, but no one's gonna tell you you have to wear it. Um, and I would say if, if you are someone who wears a helmet on each and every ride, um, avoid the helmet shaming. Um, that, that tends to just look bad. <laughs> um, it's not gonna encourage someone by you know, scolding them and, and telling them, oh, you're doing it wrong or you're not a real cyclist. You know, in Europe, most people don't wear helmets and you know, the, the statistics you know, don't paint the US in a, <clears throat> a very good light as far as more crashes and that. So encourage it, um, but we wanna make sure you're wearing it properly, right? So there's lots of different helmets. Um, I'm putting mine on here. I don't get anything fancy. Uh, this was a $40 helmet from Seven Mile Cycles here in Elk Grove. Um, the more you pay, they, maybe it's gonna be, might look cooler though. I don't know that I look cool in any, anything except for my cycling cap, of course. Um, so yeah, you can pay anywhere between probably 20 and $300. Just find a helmet that fits your head properly. And in terms of fitting, um, what I wanted to show real quick is, um, we call it eyes, ears, and chin. So uh, again, when in teaching classes, especially to, to new cyclists, teach them these three things and so they could properly fit the helmet on their own. So the first thing, eyes, uh, which means, you know, I can pretty much look up and see the lip of, of my helmet here, which means it's level on my head. You know, we don't want it sitting back here. It's exposing a very important sensitive part of your brain. You really want it to be level on your head. The ears, and hopefully you guys can see okay here, we can see you. Should form a Y just underneath your earlobe. You don't want it tugging on your earlobe. You don't want it open all the way down underneath your chin. When those are set properly, your ears are anchors and stops the helmet from moving back and forth or side to side, I guess. So that I find that to be the uh, when fitting helmets, the, the adjustment I have to make most often is to adjust these straps. And then the chin underneath the helmet, a couple fingers at most. You don't want it too tight. You want to be able to breathe or have a conversation, right? And then this particular helmet has a little dial in back so I can dial it in. Um, but again, don't worry about the price of your helmet. What you want to look for is that certification, either this um, Consumer Protection, Consumer Product Safety Commission or the ANSI certification, which means the helmet's been tested. And if you were to fall and hit your head, it meets their standards. Can I interject real quick? Please do. So I will say they do have to be certified just like car safety seats. So helmets you can buy pretty much anywhere, bike shops, big box stores. One thing is with um, more expensive helmets, they may have better ventilators and they may have that adjustment in the back to have a better okay. fit. But as long as it's got that certification, it's going to protect you if you crash. And if you ride enough, you're going to tip over at some point. <laughs> yeah. And so if you crash, so what, you know, when do you replace it? Um, if you hit your head in a crash, you know, it, it's just densely packed styrofoam, right? You may not see if there's a, a crack internally or something that's compromised the helmet. So the suggestion is if you crash and hit your head, it's, that's time to replace it. Or, you know, experts will say anywhere between five and seven years, uh, the, the, the material does tend to dry out. So if you, if you pull out your helmet and like mine here has a date in it, uh, or say I think it was July of 2017, if I recall, uh, if you pull yours out and it says July 2010, maybe it's time to replace it. And then by wearing a helmet, you're setting a good example for others, uh, especially if you're trying to encourage kids to, to wear helmets. All right, so Gina. So what next? should I wear when I ride? And the easy answer to this one is you don't need anything special, okay? Um, I listed a bunch of different places or types of riding there, there are, right? So if you're riding for exercise or recreation, yeah, you know, maybe you want to have a dry fit shirt or, um, you know, some lycra shorts or something more breathable, you know, depending on the, the time of year, maybe something that's going to wick moisture away, <clears throat> remove heat, retain heat. Yeah, you know, there are different types of uh, materials for different situations. If you're running errands, you're riding for transportation, uh, like I've got on right now, yeah, a pair of cargo shorts and a t-shirt. Right on a t-shirt would be, you know, certainly recommended, uh, but you don't need anything fancy uh, just for getting around town. 
Uh, if you choose to commute, um, <laughs> I guess not many people are going into work right now, but you know, you, I'm sure you've heard stories of folks who uh, you know, can commute um, and will, will roll up their clothes. Maybe they wear a shirt and tie. Um, there's a gentleman by the name of Jurgen from Arlington Heights. He would, he would wear a shirt and tie um, to work or while he would ride. Um, so, you know, there's different tricks if, if you want to commute by bike. Um, the racing and touring, that's where, again where you get more into some of the specialized clothing. clothing. Um, so, you know, just, just ride, wear what is, what is comfortable and what seems right for the conditions. Don't worry about having to spend a lot of money on clothing, especially when you're first starting out. Uh, and then riding at night, I did add the, the one picture in there um, of a retro reflective, whew, it's a tongue twister, clothing. Um, so it makes you visible uh, <clears throat> when car headlights hit them. So when you ride at night, you do want to stand out, whether it's with lights, um, clothing, ideally both. So just know that that's, that's a special circumstance when you're riding at night. <clears throat> All right, Gina. So what item should I bring with me? Yeah, this is a, this is a great question because, um, you know, you, you can carry too little, you can carry too much, maybe not too much, but you, you could go the kitchen sink route, which is kind of <laughs> what I end up doing uh, more often than not, but you really just want to be prepared, right? So that's the, the Boy Scout motto. Well, that applies to cyclists too. So uh, at a minimum, bring your wallet or bring an ID. Uh, some folks have I just made photocopies of the driver's license. So you don't have to actually drive, you know, leave it in your you know, bag and <clears throat> know it's there. Um, bring a spare inner tube, one that fits your, your tire. Um, oftentimes, you know, even if, if you're, I would say if you're not comfortable or familiar with fixing a flat tire, you may encounter someone who will, right? So um, if you have your tube with you, then they can help you with that. And then having the pump or the CO2 cartridge, so your pump is the photo on the bottom, the CO2 cartridge is a uh, little, I think they're, I think they're aluminum or are they steel? Maybe they're steel. It's just compressed air. So that'll help you, uh, uh, help you to fill your tire if, if you were to, uh, to get a flat. The multi-tool just has lots of different tools. So if you need to make adjustments or uh, some of them even have some tire levers on there to help with uh, taking the, the tire off when you're, dealing with the flat. So it's just an, a nice tool to have. And then of course your cell phone. So maybe, maybe you get a flat and you can't fix it. Maybe you have another mechanical issue that can't be fixed. Maybe you, you're riding from home and um, it starts to rain unexpectedly and you, you want to get a ride home. At least have your cell phone so you can give someone a call. And also if you were to get in a crash, um, you'd, have, you'd be able to call someone um, or the authorities you know, if, if need be. Um, there's tips in there about snacks and, and water and cash. Yeah. yeah. And the, you know, that, that makes sense if you're riding longer distances, if you're riding to the grocery store, you know, you, I'm assuming if, if it's not 10 miles or more away, you can get there, <clears throat> you know, without water and snacks, but plan ahead and be prepared. All right. Let me see. So the next question, Gina, what traffic laws apply to cyclists? That is a great question. Uh, and it is many of the same laws. And I don't expect you guys to be able to read the Illinois Vehicle Code there, um, but, but I will read it for you. So the Illinois Vehicle Code states that traffic laws apply to persons riding bicycles. Every person riding a bicycle upon a highway shall be granted all of the rights, including, but not limited to rights under Article 9 of, in this, uh, this chapter here, and shall be subject to all the duties applicable to a driver of vehicle, except as there's some special um, um, exceptions. So, you know, to kind of break that down, it's all the, the, the same rights and the same responsibilities as a motor vehicle. I think that, that's what's important to take away. Exceptions are things like, <clears throat> excuse me, riding on the interstate. I don't know if you'd want to do that. In Illinois, you can't. <clears throat> Out in Wyoming, I believe in Colorado, some other states where that's the only way to get um, from point A to point e, B in certain areas, yeah, you can do it. But not in Illinois. <clears throat> um, other exceptions or other laws that are in our Illinois bicycle law um, wallet card, which is very handy by the way, um, points out things like you can't have more than one person per bicycle. Um, you, well, you can't ride against traffic in a car either. Um, carrying things on your handlebars, um, 
not recommended. Um, one that uh, unfortunately is, is maybe in the news or on the social media <clears throat> all too often is riding more than two abreast. So cyclists can ride side by side, but if there's a third person in, in the line, <clears throat> that's not, that, then you'd be breaking the law. So that's something to be conscious of. Um, riding on the sidewalk is another topic that tends to, um, to kind of divide people. So some folks say, no, it's, it's illegal. Some folks say you can't do it. Some folks say that's the only place I'm gonna ride. Um, unless there is a local ordinance that says you cannot ride on the sidewalk, you can ride on the sidewalk. But when you encounter a pedestrian, you're to dismount your bicycle. Now, if you are you know, on a sidewalk and you pass a pedestrian and everything's all wonderful and you say hello and you know, that's the extent of the inaction, no big deal. If you were to happen to, to bump into that person and it's found that you did not dismount, and actually I would say even if, even if you, you know, for some reason you did and <clears throat> that person fell over, you know, you're, you're gonna be found liable because you were a, a vehicle riding on the sidewalk. So don't discourage people from riding on sidewalks, you know, encourage them to get to the point where they're comfortable riding uh, on the road, especially adults. <clears throat> so there are laws, um, that are meant to protect cyclists. So we, we have a digital ad campaign going on right now. And boy, if, if you jump on a, to some of those, you're gonna see some very, very colorful comments. Um, there's a need for education. Um, there's, there's a need to, um, you know, to, to kind of meet in the middle and share information with, with motorists uh, all around the state. But know that the laws that are in place are meant to protect cyclists because we are a vulnerable, vulnerable road user. Um, and then know that when you're out riding, no matter if you're riding alone or with a group or whatever, you're assume you're representing all cyclists. That you, the impression you leave is going to be um, the, the folks you pass, motorists you pass are going to um, leave with that impression. So you know, ride properly, ride safely, uh, communicate, you know, obey the laws. That's, you don't want something that you do to leave a negative impression that then may affect someone down the road. And if you want to get more information about the laws um, for cyclists in Illinois, one of our sponsors, Brendan Kevinitis, did a really great session a couple weeks back, and that's one of the, web, the recorded webinars that are on our site. So I wanted to add one more thing. So there's just <clears> a little picture of the Illinois bike laws. Um, we have sent out copies to, I believe, all of the bike shops in Illinois. There is yeah. also um, a PDF of it on our website. But if you're not able to get to your bike shop right now, and if you want a copy or if you want, if you're a member of a club and you want some copies to hand out to people, uh, just send us an email and we would be happy to mail that to you. Excellent point. Thanks, Gina. All right. So how can I be safe while riding on trails? Yeah, and so trails are in the news quite a bit lately because of um, social distancing guidelines and that, but assume this is kind of your normal day uh, without a pandemic. And the answer to that is really obey um, trail etiquette guidelines. So Cook County Forest Preserve, DuPage County Forest Preserve, um, at least the ones, you know, the forest preserve districts in the Chicagoland area, that I'm familiar with, they don't have hard and fast, and they do have some laws, but when it comes to how to kind of moderate traffic um, or different modes coexisting, <clears throat> um, there's not a lot of laws. What they say is, if you as a cyclist do this, and, and you as a runner do this, and this person as a roller rail does this, well, we can all coexist peacefully, right? So that's kind of the idea behind trail etiquette. <clears throat> Just a few tips. Uh, you know, when you're when passing someone, as cyclists are moving faster than than most folks on a trail, you want to announce. So whether that's a bell, or if you simply say passing, um, you just want to let people know that you're passing. I would say at Bussy Woods, just based on a you know a kind of a, a quick estimate, I'd say three quarters of the people don't say a word. So you know, we want to encourage folks to let. The, those that they're passing know that they're passing. You don't want to startle someone. Um, I'm not very loud in general, so I, I do like the bell. It just gets people's attention. When you pass, you pass on the left. So you ride on the right and you pass on the left. Um, 
pretty common. You'd think it's common sense, but um, I have seen folks, you know, do some pretty crazy things, um, especially if, if uh, pace or speed or time is a, a factor. <clears throat> oh, <laughs> looks like I, I lost some letters there. <clears throat> we want to slow down for pedestrians. If you're on a trail, you, you as a cyclist, um, you, you tend to be, you could be the bully of the trail. So, you, you know, if you want motorists to give you courtesies when you're riding on the roads, you can't then go on a trail and not offer the same courtesies to slower moving traffic, if you will. So make sure you slow down for pedestrians. Uh, it's, you know, it's not a race. Uh, and if you happen to stop, maybe you see a friend, maybe you have a flat, maybe you need to get some water, move off the trail. That's just a uh, common courtesy so you don't kind of gum everything up. And the last bullet point I have is, is don't be that guy. I think we've probably all seen that guy, <clears throat> the one who's out to top his, uh, his best Strava segment or his best loop or <clears throat> whatever it might be and takes unnecessary and um, you know, very potentially um, you know, bad things can happen based on the chances that they take. So please don't, don't be that guy. <clears throat> So that's what we have for trails. Um, there's some great articles if you search online for other tips on how to, to, to uh, improve safety on trails. And again, do your part. You know, we wanna make sure that everyone there, these are, for the most part, you're riding on multi-use trails, not bike trails. So everyone has the, the right to be there. Someone did point out, why do people jump to the left when you call out to your left? And I guess it just depends on if they're not normally on the trails, which you're gonna have a lot more now. Um, it, it does tend to startle them and they do seem to automatically jump to your left. So if I have time, I will call out very nicely. I'm going to pass on your left, but yeah, it's just, you know, just always be a little cautious. You don't know what they're going to do. And we are now on to how can I be safe while riding on roads? All right. Let's talk about roads because a lot of folks um, will will decide as they, they get started riding that, you know, trails are, are where they want to start. And, you know, sure, you're not dealing with motor vehicles. Um, there are certain elements of trails that can sometimes be more dangerous, right? So, um, you know, with everything that you do on your bike, you want to kind of slowly move out of your comfort zone. So start on trails. Maybe you're going to graduate to your neighborhood roads, right? That That's where we want want to see that vibrant community with lots of folks riding on the road. So, um, and then, you know, perhaps from there you get comfortable riding on some arterials and, you know, before you know it, you're one of the one percenters, not those one percenters, but you know, the cyclist one percenter. Um, so yeah, how can you be safe while riding on the road? So you know, really, uh, if you obey, obey the laws, uh, you communicate with those that you're riding either with or near, and then if you act predictably, those are three real easy ways to improve your safety. Um, I mentioned here to read behind the headlines. And so, um, you know, there are all too often some terrible stories that we hear in the news, see on the news, read in the paper <clears throat> about someone who um, was struck and killed or, you know, whatever the, the circumstance might be, right? <clears throat> Sorry, I got a tickle in my throat tonight. Um, so what I encourage you to do is, again, read beyond those headlines. Find out what happened. What were the circumstances? Don't simply say, oh, that, you know, that's why I don't ride or that's that, you know, it's not safe. Riding, riding a bike isn't safe because oftentimes um, there's something that happened, um, not consciously, someone, maybe someone didn't make that choice. Maybe they were wearing dark clothing at night without lights. Maybe they were riding against traffic. Maybe it was bad weather and they got caught in the bad weather. No matter the situation, if, if you know, a cyclist or a pedestrian for that matter, really anyone, right, dies on a road, it's terrible. But, uh, you know, we can learn from that situation. Um, and so I would just encourage you, especially if you're getting, if you're new to cycling, to keep that in mind and to learn a little bit more. As a formal, former journalist, can I interject real quick? Please. And whereas there are loads of people that ride every day without issues, um, news does tend to focus on what's not the norm or what yeah. is newsworthy. So 
that while there are articles about people who are riding their bikes, particularly um, maybe in bike month, there'll probably be more. Um, it's usually those things that are out of the norm that tend mm -hmm. to, to draw more new stories. Yeah, they're looking for ratings, right? <laughs> Not always ratings, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, and I'd like to pause real quick and say hello to my sister, Cheryl Dubois, who joined. Thanks, sis. Hi, Dave, sis. <laughs> um, all right, so thank you for that, Gina. Uh, the smart cycling philosophy um, is that cyclists fare best when they act and are treated as drivers of vehicles. That's the, the foundation of the League of American Bicyclists education program. And so what that more or less means is bike the way you drive. It's been called vehicular cycling. It's It's predictable, it's understandable. Motorists then, if you, if you do what a motorist expects you to do um, versus trying to do something um, different, you, you know, chances that you're of safe, safely returning from that trip are much greater. <clears throat> the term practicable, which is a mouthful in, in, in and of its own. <clears throat> so the idea is to ride to as far right as practicable. That doesn't mean you have to ride as far right as possible. <clears throat> it just means where is it safe and um, so you're safe so you're visible where on a roadway should you ride and, and that's not going to be in the gutter that's going to be in <clears throat> more often than not the right third of a lane kind of and if, if you ride on roads that uh, are, are well traveled you oftentimes see either like a, a slow a, a light indentation in the road or maybe you see kind of a, a tire track almost it's kind of where you want to be Next time you, you're driving, you, you encounter a motorcyclist, watch where he rides, he or she. And that, that tends to be where you're gonna wanna be as a cyclist when, you just, when you're, you're kind of just riding straight down the road. <clears throat> uh, there are some crash prevention skills that, um, that can be um, taught in, a, in a, a smart cycling class, but there's uh, something called the layers of prevention. And so <clears throat> in a nutshell, you wanna control your bike. Don't fall over. Don't collide with others, right? That, that's kind of maybe a no-brainer, um, but that's the first thing you want to do. The second step is to follow the rules. Follow the laws. Um, ride predictably. Um, don't cause crashes. Right? Do what you can to avoid crashes. Uh, third and, and oftentimes um, the most important is going to be your lane position. So what that means is you want to discourage others' mistakes. So as we talked earlier about um, riding as far right as practicable, you don't want to be in that gutter. When, you, when you're riding in a gutter, you're, you're really inviting a motorist to try to squeeze by. So by ri riding a little further out in the lane, you, f you for force them to go around you in, um, in another lane. So yeah, discourage those mistakes. Intersections are another um, kind of a, a key area. If you are riding your bike on a road and you come up to a red light at an intersection, you, you want to be in the center of that lane waiting at that light. Um, think, what would I do if I were in a car? And that can be, a, it can be uncomfortable sometimes if the car behind you is turning, for example. Um, and in turn, if you're encountering a red light, don't ride up on the right or between cars to get to the front. If there's no infrastructure that allows for that, you take your place in traffic and you sit there. There's nothing, there's few things other than maybe blowing stop signs that will irk a motorist more than if a cyclist rides up on the right <clears throat> and, and there's not, it kind of positions themselves in front and there's not infrastructure there. So if you do those things, control your bike, follow the rules, and mind your lane position, you could eliminate 90% of crashes. <clears throat> and then the last couple things to, to note is um, you want to try to avoid others' mistakes. So you know, ride defensively, pay attention to what's happening. If you're riding in a group, make sure, um, you know, the group knows kind of how to, you're going to communicate and what, and what you're going to do in certain situations. <clears throat> and then when all else fails, you know, most people are going to crash at some point. Well, be prepared. Wear your helmet. Um, I, I always wear some sort of gloves because the knee-jerk reaction when you fall is to put your hands out. And then I always wear something on you know, some sort of eye protection. So whether it's sunglasses, you know, when it's bright out or just some clear, clear glasses, I actually just bought a pair of safety glasses, just something to protect your eyes from dust, debris, bugs, because you don't want something flying in your eye and then kind of losing control. So those are important things um, 
to keep in mind. And then our bikesafetyquiz.com is a great tool. Um, and I, I'd say that not only as a staff member of Ride Illinois, but as a firm believer in that long before I started. Um, what I wanna do is ask you guys a question here from the quiz, and it's gonna be the second or the rightmost image that is on the slide. Let me launch this here. So the question is, <clears throat> oops, hang on. Sample question. Uh, so when going straight at an intersection with a right turn only lane, where should you ride? So you've got four choices, paths one, two, three, and four, and hopefully you guys can see that well enough. <clears throat> So one kind of swings out um, to the middle of a couple lanes, two is more or less straight through, three <clears throat> going into the turn lane, um, and then four is that magnet to the curb. <coughs> Ooh, excuse me. All right, we got 50% voted here. <clears throat> Give it just a second more. Thank you all for participating. All right, I'm going to end it here and share the results. And I'll, I'll point out that this is one of the reasons that bike safety quiz is so important is that it gets you thinking, right? So we've got a couple people that chose path one, which is moving kind of in the center of, of two through lanes. The majority of you chose path two, which is the correct answer. 11 of you chose that. Um, staying in that right third and um, staying in the rightmost lane that serves your destination. If you're going straight, that's where you want to be. Now, three and four, you go into the turn lane. Um, and if you're going straight, it's just going to cause issues when you're trying to merge back out. It might seem like the courteous thing to do, but it's not necessarily the safest thing to do. So you want to, you want to choose path two. So this is just one example of the questions on, on bike safety quiz. Um, do take the quiz and, um, and learn quite a bit more. And again, don't be that guy. <clears throat> don't be the person blowing through red lights and stop signs and you know, riding unpredictably, <clears throat> pulling in between lanes of traffic. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not going to end well for, for, for a cyclist. When it comes to a, a, a cyclist versus a car, the odds are not in our favor. And I will add, if you take the quiz, the nice thing is if you got the wrong answer, it would kind of almost be like Dave was there with you. Right? The quiz would then explain to you <laughs> what the correct answer was and why um, that answer would be better. And now if you don't sleep tonight, it's because I am with you. While you're, <laughs> you're in their heads. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So just a quick other uh, additional note about bike safety quiz. Um, we've got, there's three levels in each quiz total range of questions is 25 to 33. So it's not a ton. Um, you, you have those three chances to get it right. Uh, they're all, all the questions are based on relevant Illinois traffic laws. And then uh, kind of an exciting um, point here is we're going to be re releasing a Spanish version soon as well as a downloadable PDF. So if you are a, a cyclist and a motorist, well, you've got two quizzes you can take. If you know um, you know, you got kids or you've got grandkids or neighbor's kids, they can take the cyclist quiz, which is kind of geared towards fourth and fifth grade level. And then we also have a truck driver module that, um, that helps to explain how truck drivers can drive safely around cyclists. All right, a couple more questions. How do I choose a route? Yeah, there's lots of different ways, right? So there's a lot of apps out there. And if you use an app, please, uh, in the chat, note which app you might use. I mean, or there's, uh, there's <clears throat> Google Maps and Strava and Map My Ride and Kamut and, you know, there are a dime a dozen nowadays, if you, especially if you have a GPS, right? Um, but if you want to plan a, a route prior to leaving the house, a lot of communities will have bike maps. And so if you're riding within your community, it'll show you which roads are safe to bike on. Um, IDOT has a great set of maps so that this uh, map of uh, Illinois there breaks, um, breaks the state up into the nine IDOT districts and there's one map for each district. Um, it, it shows the bicycle level of service, which means how safe is it for a cyclist, color coded. So it's a real good resource, especially if you're planning, you know, kind of a fun uh, touring type of trip. Uh, there's also the, the Strava global heat map, which I do have the the URL here, let me see if I can share it in the chat. <clears throat> um, it's just an interesting way to see where people who use Strava tend to ride. 
So if you're going to a place you're not familiar with, well, take a look at the Strava global heat, global heat map and it might help you choose between you know, road A and road B. And um, aside from those resources, go to your local, local bike shop or talk to other cyclists you encounter. Um, they're the folks that are gonna know the area you know, around a shop or favorite places to ride, favorite places to go. Maybe you're looking for a new destination. You know, form a, a little bit of a rapport with your local bike shop. And uh, you know, they're, they're certainly willing to give some of that information to you. And we do have links to some of the bike maps, particularly the ones we've done on our website. And I believe we have links to IDOTS as well. Yeah, right. You can't download a PDF if you don't have the print copy. So right. how can I encourage others to join me? Yeah, so the idea is um, you are now, you know, you, you're drinking the funny punch. You're, you're hooked. You see that biking, you can do, you know, short trips, errands, everything, um, some weekend rides, whatever. Um, and you want it, now you, you're like, wow, man, this is awesome. I want other people to join me. Um, so tell them, tell people about that. Tell them where you started and, and maybe where you're at. Maybe you, you couldn't ride more than a couple of miles to start. And now, you know, you rode 15 miles last week. <clears throat> That's great. But remember, it's not about you, right? So now maybe you're riding your 15, 20, 25 miles and your friend can only ride two. Don't invite them to go on that first ride and make it a 20 mile ride. You know, be that mentor, someone who will encourage them to, to get to your level. So start with that shorter ride. You know, think of, I know when my kids were young, <clears throat> a lot of our bike rides um, would end up at a destination. Maybe it was Dairy Queen or you know, maybe it was 7-Eleven to get a sur Serpy. <clears throat> it's kind of the same mentality when you're trying to get um, you know, a friend or a family member or a spouse to ride with you, you know, give them some incentive and then share your enthusiasm, you know, encourage them when all of a sudden you're riding into, uh, into the wind or you're going up a hill, you know, tell them they're doing awesome. Tell them, you know, it's wind builds character, or, you know, hills build care, whatever it is, you know, be their cheerleader and encourage them to, to keep going. And then as you learn new skills, share those with others, teach them that ABC quick check. As you learn to fix a flat tire, teach them how to fix a flat. Do it, you know, when you have a social gathering, not when you're forced to do it necessarily. So you, you want to impart your knowledge and share that with others because hopefully then they'll, they'll pay, that, uh, pay that forward. So how can I safely ride with my kids? And this is, um, it's important. You, want to instill, um, as we saw earlier, 48% of adolescents or people who rode as adolescents, you know, were healthier adults. So you want to start early. Uh, the picture here is actually of my son. And if, if, he, if you're on there, Bradley, I'm sure you're probably mortified right now, but. <clears throat> oh, I did the same to my son for the mountain bike <laughs> session. So you want to encourage him from an early age and you can see Bradley was wearing his helmet. Did he always want to wear his helmet? No. You know, we, we, there, there's some cool helmet options out there. Like Nutcase makes some really awesome helmets. Um, you know, make it, make it fun. Um, make sure you wear your helmet as well. You know, you don't want to, you practice, you want to practice what you preach, right? Um, what, uh, what I find is that a lot of adults, um, because they're faster, are riding in front of their kids. Uh, we'd like to encourage you to ride behind kids, or maybe it's a friend who's just getting out for the first time. You can be their eyes and ears. You can tell them, you can help them anticipate what's coming up. I mean, kids don't know traffic signs and road markings and things like that, <clears throat> or what to do in a certain situation, right? So adults definitely have you ride behind the kids um, just so you can kind of look at, uh, at, at what you'll be encountering in the next few seconds. <clears throat> and then, you know, introduce this, those signs and road markings. Tell them what it means. Uh, and then parents and guardians, um, it's up to you when your kids can start riding um, on roads and not on sidewalks. Uh, every kid's different. Um, you know when your kid is going to be familiar with, um, you know, what to do if, if a car is passing or what to do at a driveway, for example, right? So again, going back, there's, you know, unless a, a local, um, local community or municipality has an ordinance that says you can't ride on sidewalks, Keep the kids on the sidewalks until you're comfortable with it and definitely have them be careful near driveways um, that is one of the most dangerous places for kids that's where a lot of crashes occur simply because 
uh, you know, especially younger kids are small, motorists aren't looking for them when they're backing out of their driveways. So do tell them to be, be careful there. And there's a great group. Um, they've got a Facebook group. They've got a website, a very active group in Chicago, Chicago Family Biking, um, <clears throat> that is run by some friends of ours. Uh, check their site out. Um, they've got great tips. They've got some good events that are happening or will hopefully be happening. Um, and it's all about how to learn to ride with your kids. <clears throat> so first I want to mention one other thing. I know you said you brought your kids like Dairy Queen and 7-Eleven. My, at my kid's school, we had a bike club and we would just ride to a park, let yeah. them run around and they thought that was awesome as well. <laughs> so now how can I make a difference? Yeah, so again, you are, uh, you are firmly a believer in the benefits of, of cycling here. And so um, you are just by definition at that point an advocate. So uh, by speaking up and making, um, you know, you're making a difference by encouraging others, you're making a difference. Um, there's also a number of organizations out there, um, you know, in addition to Ride Illinois, that are, are working on behalf of cyclists. So <clears throat> just kind of going from the, the widest geographic coverage, <clears throat> excuse me again, to the narrowest, we've got the League of American Bicyclists. Uh, they've been around since 1880, um, a great organization that is working uh, at the national and federal level on behalf of cyclists. Uh, Ride Illinois mentioned as, as your statewide advocacy organization, the Active Transportation Alliance, which is the former Chicago Bike Federation. Um, they're in the city and they, they more, work mostly in the Chicagoland area. They do a little bit of work outside the Chicagoland area. Uh, there's rails to trails, there's people for bikes, um, boy, you name it, uh, you can find an organization. And there's lots of local bike clubs, <clears throat> so such as the Friends of Cycling in Elk Grove, which is the local advocacy organization that I helped to form here. So look around, um, there are folks in your community that are riding. And, uh, you know, connect with them, find out what the issues are, talk to your local elected officials, that's a great place to start, and, and share your concerns uh, if you have them. And then in the end, just keep riding. You know, the more you ride, the more you're gonna notice, the more you're gonna enjoy it. Um, and and the, the more biking will have, a, will make that difference in your life. So how I can I support Ride Illinois? Yeah, well, we want you to ride, um, not only for recreation, but for transportation. Um, for, to me, transportation cycling is kind of the holy grail. If I can go somewhere and not have to drive, um, that's a win. Um, ask yourself can, you know, before you go somewhere, can I bike there? And if the answer is yes, or even maybe, go for it. Follow the rules of the road. So again, ride predictably, ride legally, um, ride where motorists and the way that motorists expect you to ride. Um, you can certainly talk up riding in Illinois to friends and family. We would certainly appreciate that or share our social media pages. Um, Bike safety quiz with our digital ad campaigns is kind of going gangbusters right now. We're getting a lot of a lot of traction, so we want to we want to uh, kind of jump on that, especially in um, this time where folks are kind of itching to get out and do things. So we see more people out on the road. Um, so share the bike safety quiz because if folks are hopping out for the first time, we want them to be fairly knowledgeable uh, when they go out there. Um, and then you've got our email addresses. Um, it's down at the bottom to the info email address. Both Gina and I receive that. Let us know what's going on. Share your suggestions, your concerns, your ideas, whether it's to improve safety or to improve our organization. You know, we are a mighty staff of two and a half. So if we have more folks working on our behalf and sharing ideas and stepping up, God bless you. We, we certainly would appreciate that. I uh, mentioned the social media. And of course, you know, if, if you are so inclined, become a member. Um, we are a member supported organization. So membership dollars definitely fund the work that we do. And with that, um, I'm gonna, I guess we're doing pretty well on time. I know we started a couple minutes uh, late, but uh, we do have some time for questions. Um, and I'm trying to find the question panel. Doesn't look like any have come in in the, the question. Now, but we've had some questions question, in the chat, but. All right. What do we Although have here? people are looking for or thinking of questions, I'm very curious about Paul's comment at that at least now he's wearing shoes. So I'm wondering <laughs> if like when it's cold out, he means he's wearing boots or if he's just really hardcore and just bikes and socks or something. Got to clue us in, Paul. 
It's kind of scrolling through the chat here. Um, Ron, you asked if the heat map, um, it, it, it's, it is free to a certain extent. I mean, yeah, if you, with a Strava subscription or if you wanted to access the data, you pay for it. But that link that I put in there will take you to the global heat map and you should be able to zoom in, um, you know, based on location or zip code. Paul said it's between him and David Gibbs. Now, yeah. um, while we're waiting for questions, I would point out to maybe see if you're with a new rider, if they're open to tips. Um, I know after yeah. several bike rides with my sister, I noticed she was never shifting gears at all. And it took yeah. a couple more rides before she was willing to let her younger sister give her some tips about how to shift to get up the hills. That, that's a very good point. You know, good yeah. intentions, but they, they only go so far, right? <clears throat> and we do have a question here. Um, so Ron said, I have read that many towns and city, cities, um, bike dealers are experiencing a boom in, in sales. Any thoughts if local bike dealers are having that same experience? Um, I can speak on behalf of a couple shops that I've visited, um, seven mile cycles here in Elk Grove, um, and I pass by them today. Uh, <clears throat> granted, you know, they have to keep social distancing rules, but there's a constant line. And when I last spoke with Vince, he was kind of pulling his hair out <laughs> because he was so busy, which of course is a good thing. And then um, never ending cycles out in Streamwood. Uh, they haven't been super busy, but they have been selling more bikes. And one of the things that Mike pointed out is that um, he, from what he's heard, there's going to be um, fewer bikes available because of supply chains and bikes, many are built in China. So there's going to be a, a period of time where um, there won't be as many bikes available. So if you're in the market for a bike, you probably want to, you probably want to go there sooner than later. Can I take Nicole's? Sure. Uh, unless you, you can go for it. So I have to hmm. say, I, um, she asked about for going to clipless pedals um, outside. And I would say I did the same thing she did at that point. I wasn't didn't ride all year round yet. So that winter I practiced a lot with the trainer. Um, even then though, uh, I would do some very easy rides first, either on trails or on low traffic residential streets and really get used to it. But I would also expect that all of us, I think at least once have stopped and forgot to unclip and just tipped over. For me, it was at the late ride one year with all my friends from back in high school. Um, but yeah, the more practice you do uh, um, by yourself when there's not a lot of traffic, even in a parking lot, will help you for when all of a sudden you have to stop quickly so you remember to do that actual unclipping. Yeah, you want it to be um, second nature. You want it to be a reaction, not something you have to think about. So Yeah, and some good tips. Richard mentioned practice on the trainer, which Nicole said she already was. And then, of course, make sure that that clip is uh, the cleat set up properly. And that's something that if you're not sure, you could bring it to a bike shop to have them help you with. All right, what else? We see that can't Crank Revolution's doing all right. That's good to hear. Um, yeah, I know a lot of the shops I've heard about are very busy. One interesting thing is, you know, it's actually called clipless pedals because back in the day, it used to be a toe clip that you slid your foot into. So then even though you kind of click into the pedal, it's actually called clipless as opposed to clip pedal. So my little little known and somewhat interesting fact of the day. Practice riding with cleats on grass. That's a good idea. So if you don't unclip, it's a softer surface to fall onto. So I have one, one last um, question here, a poll I'm going to launch. So there you have it. Are you a Ride Illinois member? And your options are yes, no, or not yet. We prefer that uh, the yes and not yet, of course. Um, <laughs> we have our membership. Um, our spring appeal is, is kicking off here soon. We, we do have some, um, some fun raffle prizes. So if you, if you sign up during the spring appeal, um, not only could you get the Maple Leaf coffee at the household level, um, but we're going to have a, a custom art. So I showed this card earlier, but so Jen does a bunch of um, just custom bike themed art, kind of the same style. So we're going to raffle off one of her art pieces and then Life Behind Bars <clears throat> Cycling. Um, some of you may know Dennis. Um, he w is, is going to offer a, a personalized custom cycling jersey. So we'll, we'll use uh, that as some incentive during our, um, our May campaign. So 
All right. And so someone mentioned there are um, a lot of bike clubs like Bicycle Club of Lake County that are members with us. Um, mm -hmm. We do, of course, also encourage them like Richard to be uh, a member of us as well. And if any of you are not sure if you are currently a member, if you want to shoot me an email, I would be happy to look that up for you or let you know when your membership is currently expiring. Great. So with that, I know we're a little bit after eight. I um, appreciate all the, the questions and the input and everybody taking the time to join us tonight. Uh, we want to keep the conversation going. You know, we don't want this to be a one-time thing. So uh, again, you have our email. Um, we have a phone number on the website too. Share your thoughts, ideas, concerns. Um, you know, we'll certainly do what we can and, and hope we can make biking better and safer and more fun no matter where you live. And if your friends are thinking of getting into biking, then have them watch this webinar. Yeah, and take the quiz. Tomorrow is Century Day, according to... Oh. I had not heard that, but... Well, good luck, Richard. Yeah, I don't think I'll be riding quite that much tomorrow, but I will be out. <laughs> well, thanks, everybody. It is going to be a nice weekend. Uh, pay attention to those social distance laws if you're going to go out to trails. Um, otherwise, be safe and... And hopefully we'll see you on one of our upcoming webinars. We have one next week on Wednesday at noon, which is um, the Danish Cycling Assembly, Cycling Games for Kids. And then uh, I think if Katie, Katie is still on here, Katie is our newest board member. Um, she and Molly are down in, in Southern Illinois and they're gonna give a presentation about biking in Southern Illinois, which is a hidden gem. So put it on your list. Uh, that webinar is, uh, Boy, Friday the 22nd, I believe. Yeah. I yes, May 22nd. Yes, thank you. There it is. It's going to be a good one. Agreed. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Gina, for your help tonight. Everybody stay safe. We'll see you next time.